Mr. Mew appears today in court for sentencing. Count one is first degree reckless homicide, which is a class B felony. Uh, with the dangerous weapon enhancer, the maximum possible penalty is 45 years of incarceration, initial confinement, and 20 years of extended supervision. On counts two through five, Mr. Mew appears for sentencing on first degree reckless endangerment, class F felonies with the dangerous weapon enhancer. The maximum possible penalties are 12 and a half years initial confinement and five years of extended supervision. Uh, last count six is battery. Uh, that is a misdemeanor. Uh, with the dangerous weapon enhancer, he faces a maximum possible sentence of 15 months. Uh, in preparation for today's sentencing, I reviewed a number of materials. Uh, First, I reviewed the uh, pre-sentence investigation report prepared by the Department of Corrections. It's a 43-page report that provided me with uh, information that I uh, knew and information that I did not know about Mr. Mew, about his victims, families, about <laughs> Mr. Mew's background, about all aspects of this case, many of which were talked about today. Uh, that PSI report also included a sentencing recommendation. Uh, I also reviewed Mr. Nelson's uh, sentencing memorandum. Uh, it was very helpful. Uh, it provided uh, more information about Mr. Mew and his background, uh, and I valued uh, that information. Uh, Mr. Nelson uh, submitted uh, numerous letters from Mr. Mew's personal friends and coworkers. Uh, I read all of those. I also read the relevant portions of the file, including the complaint, the jury instructions, uh, and the verdict. In a moment, I will pronounce a sentence that I believe is just and fair. When deciding on a sentence, I must consider the gravity of the offense, including the effect on the victims. I must consider Mr. Mew's character and his rehabilitative needs. I must consider the need to protect the public. Uh, the sentence must be based on the facts of the case and the law, not personal considerations, passions, or prejudices. But judges in Wisconsin have a great deal of discretion when imposing a sentence. Uh, unlike many jurisdictions, we do not have sentencing guidelines or grids to follow. I want all of you to know that I have given this case a great deal of thought. I take my responsibility seriously. Uh, there is nothing more difficult or more solemn than imposing a sentence on another human being. As far as the gravity of the offense, the jury has spoken. Any efforts to relitigate this case are simply without merit. I firmly believe that the American criminal justice system is the best ever devised. It's not perfect, but I cannot think of a system of justice that is better at finding the truth while preserving the rights of the accused. In this case, 12 jurors reached a unanimous verdict. These 12 jurors were selected from a panel of more than 150 people. I, along with the attorneys for both sides, chose these jurors because they could be fair and impartial. The jurors came from all corners of our great county. They came from all walks of life. They were men, they were women, they were young, they were old. They listened to eight days of intense trial testimony. They examined dozens of exhibits. They deliberated for eight hours. In the end, they reached a unanimous verdict and found beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Mew was guilty of reckless homicide, reckless endangerment, and battery. Now, there are two key takeaways from this jury's verdict that I want to mention. First, the jury rejected the state's claim that Mr. Mew intended 
to kill Isaac Schumann or the surviving stabbing victims. In other words, the jury rejected the most serious crimes that would have sent Mr. Mew to prison for the rest of his life. Second, the jury rejected Mr. Mew's claims of self-defense. That means Mr. Mew did not reasonably believe that he was preventing or terminating an unlawful interference with his person, or he did not reasonably believe the force used was necessary to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm to himself. This jury found Mr. Mew guilty of reckless homicide and four counts of reckless endangerment. These crimes are serious. They mean that Mr. Mew did not think about the consequences of his behavior and that he showed utter disregard for life when he stabbed five people. For that, he will be held accountable, but the court sentence must reflect the reality that it was reckless conduct that the jury found him guilty of, not intentional conduct, which is punishable much more harshly. In weighing the gravity of the offense, I consider the impact these crimes have had on the victims. Uh, the battery to Madison Cohen was unjustified. While she did not suffer any permanent physical injuries, she has mentally suffered over this entire ordeal. Uh, she described to the PSI author uh, the toll this case has taken and continues to take on her. This offense has devastated Isaac Schumann's parents and stepfather. No parent should have to endure the loss of a child. Uh, they have had to cope with the senseless death of a loved one while enduring the weight of the criminal justice system that can be slow, confusing, and sometimes frustrating to victims. Uh, to you and to your family, there are probably no words that I can say today that will alleviate your grief, but I would be remiss for not expressing my sincere condolences to all of you. I am sorry for your loss and what you've had to endure. Although it must have been difficult, I appreciate each of you speaking today and sharing a glimpse into Isaac's life and who he was. It sounds like he was a wonderful person bright young man who had an unlimited future. And for that, we in this community have lost. A.J. Martin and Riley Madison would have died on that riverbank had it not been for the swift action of law enforcement and EMTs and other tubers who helped to treat their wounds and stabilize their condition. Uh, they had long hospital stays, but they were very fortunate to receive high quality medical treatment that restored their health. But we heard from them about the toll this matter has taken on their health, their mental psyche, and their prospects for the future. Anthony Carlson and Dante Carlson's were, wounds were less severe, but the risk to life was still present obviously because the knife was directed into, into their torso near vital organs. Uh, but they fortunately have survived. Each of the surviving stabbing victims suffered permanent physical disfigurement. That can't be overlooked. And we've heard from uh, A.J. Martin and just about how that disfigurement can affect one's life. In assessing uh, Mr. Mew's character, I must consider his conduct on July 30. Uh, Mr. Mew's crimes were the product of circumstance, not intent. 
Mr. Mew was not looking to cause trouble or hurt anyone, but he made a series of very poor decisions. When confronted with words and boorish taunts and insults, uh, Mr. Mew drew a knife and he struck Madison Cohen. That quickly culminated in senseless, lethal violence. He left the scene, leaving his victims to die while casually floating past them and emergency workers as if nothing had happened. He nearly reached his car. He nearly escaped the jurisdiction before law enforcement arrested him. These are terrible acts that form an indelible stain on his character. There is more to Mr. Mew than his worst acts. I can tell Mr. Mew has taken this case very seriously. He has been appropriate and respectful in his demeanor in court. I sense that he carries a heavy burden too. I imagine he is disheartened at the prospect of prison and the uncertainty of his future. But I also sense that Mr. Mew feels genuine sadness and remorse for what happened to his victims. I agree with the comments earlier that our criminal justice system is not designed in a way to allow people to apologize or to alleviate grief or to show respect to victims until a day like today at sentencing. That is unfortunate, but I, I heard Mr. Mew's words, both today and before, and I, I think he is sorry. Other than his conduct on July 30, Mr. Mew appears to be a, a quiet, nonviolent, peaceful man. Uh, he's never been in trouble before. Uh, he is loved by his family and friends. He's generous with his time. He helps others who are less fortunate or who are in need. Mr. Mew is respected in his community. Uh, several of his uh, personal friends and coworkers submitted letters that describe his character. Uh, those letters were not shared in court today, but some of the most common words they use to describe Mr. Mew are kind, compassionate, friendly, loyal, respectful, and honest. Mr. Mew had to overcome great obstacles in life to achieve his place. He and his family uh, suffered at the brutal hands of the communist regime in Romania. When he was a teenager, he and his family fled. They found asylum in the United States. Here he adjusted to a new country, new language, new culture. He got good grades in high school. He went on to college in South Dakota. He became an engineer. He worked hard. He had a successful career. I read somewhere uh, in my materials that the proudest moment in Mr. Mew's life was becoming an American citizen. Mr. Mew has no rehabilitative needs. That means he doesn't need rehabilitation. He has no past criminal history. He does not associate with criminals. He has never used illegal drugs. He is not an alcoholic. He has not been diagnosed with a mental health condition, although there is evidence that he's experienced PTSD from July 30 while in the jail. Mr. Mew is educated. He has vocational skills. He has life skills. He's financially secure. He has a stable home. He has positive social supports. He knows the difference between right and wrong. 
He doesn't need rehabilitation. I mention all of these things to acknowledge that there is a, a lot more to Mr. Mew than what he did on July 30. I mentioned these things to recognize that a fair and just sentence takes into account the complete person, not just his worst acts at his lowest moment. Despite the seriousness of Mr. Mew's crimes, the evidence does not show that he poses an imminent risk to the public. Mr. Mew underwent a compass assessment, which is an actuarial tool that measures a person's risk of committing future crimes. <clears throat> not surprisingly, Mr. Mew scored low risk. He's not a career criminal. He's not a violent predator. Although Mr. Mew may not pose an imminent risk to the public, the public does have a strong interest in holding people accountable who breach the social compact and commit crimes. It's the concept of punishment. Punishment is a sentencing objective. When a person commits a serious crime, that person forfeits rights enjoyed by the law-abiding community. The most restrictive punishments are reserved for those who commit the most serious crimes. The punishment exacts a toll on the offender because of the harm the offender caused to the victim and the community. Taking life and endangering the lives of others are two crimes that warrant significant punishment. Punishment for what Mr. Mew did, but also punishment that recognizes who he is and the circumstances of his crimes. Here, that punishment will involve the loss of liberty because anything else would depreciate the seriousness of his crimes. So at this time, I will impose the following sentence on Mr. Mew. <clears throat> For count one, I will impose a term of initial confinement of 20 years, followed by six years of extended supervision. For count two, involving Anthony Carlson, five years initial confinement, followed by five years of extended supervision. Count three, involving Dante Carlson, five years of initial confinement, followed by five years of extended supervision. Count four, Alexander Martin, six years of initial confinement followed by five years of extended supervision. Count five, Riley Madison, five years initial confinement followed by five years of extended supervision. Count six, Madison Cohen, 270 days of jail. Uh, Mr. Mew is not eligible for challenge incarceration program or the earned release program due to his age and the nature of these offenses. The sentences on all six counts will run concurrent. I am opposing a concurrent sentence because Mr. Mew's conduct toward each of his victims was part of a single continuous act over a short period of time. The periods of confinement take into consideration Mr. Mew's entire behavior, not just the behavior directed at any one particular individual. The conditions of extended supervision will include the following, uh, maintain absolute sobriety, uh, no possession of drugs or alcohol, you shall not enter any establishment where the primary purpose is the sale of alcohol. This will include places like bars, taverns, liquor stores, beer tents, and the like. He must complete an AODA assessment. He must comply with all recommendations of the Compass Assessment and the Department of Corrections. He must pay court costs and DNA surcharge on each count. He must submit a DNA sample. Uh, he may not have any contact with Isaac Schumann's family, including Alina and Donnie Hernandez and Scott Schumann. He may not have contact with Alexander Martin, Riley Madison, Anthony Carlson, Dante Carlson, or Madison Cohen. He is responsible for restitution, 
Uh, the state must submit its restitution demand within 30 days. The defense may have 30 days thereafter to object. Uh, if there is an objection, the matter will be scheduled for a restitution hearing. Because Mr. Mew is convicted of serious felonies, he may not possess firearms. He may not possess body armor. He may not vote or hold public office until his civil rights are restored. If he were to do any of those things contrary to law, he would subject himself to additional criminal penalties. If he violates the no contact orders, he may also subject himself to additional criminal penalties. Does the state agree on the credit calculation 732 days? Yes. All right, 732 days credit. Uh, Mr. Mew is remanded to the custody of the sheriff uh, for delivery to the Dodge Reception Center. Is there anything else for today, Mr. Anderson? No. Mr. Nelson? No, Judge. All right. Thank you all. You stand adjourned.